Hey guys, welcome back to Pop em Up Life and this lesson we're going to be looking at equilibria in industry. Just want to say, comment below if you've got anything to say, like, subscribe and hit the bell icon so you get notified when we've got new videos and share this video and the channel as well as checking out our other channels, Pop em Up Food and Pop em Up Life. Links and timestamps will be in the description. So what we got cooking for today then? Well, today we're going to be looking more in depth at the harbour process specifically. We kind of touched on that already before and looking at why decisions about conditions of an equilibria are made in industry and then look at how we can understand equilibrium through the lens of Gibbs Energy. So as usual, we've got to refresh a question to get started on. So pause the video here to give yourself some time to work on that. So when doing a question like this, we need to consider Le Chatelier's principle. Remember, it is going to oppose the change. So what information do we have in the question? Well, they say it starts at 350 Kelvin and goes to 550. So going from left to right, we have an increase in temperature. So there's before and after given in these diagrams. So on the right hand side, we can see we have three of the individual Y molecules or Y atoms. And on the left hand side, we have one. What does this tell us about the reaction then? Well, it tells us that as we increase temperature, we increase the proportion of Y and we also increase the proportion of X2. And we also see a decrease in x and we see a decrease in x y so as we've increased the temperature we can see we're increasing the proportion of the reactants and decreasing the proportion of the products what does this mean then well we've increased the temperature and that caused a shift to the left hand side so that reaction must be endothermic and because of that that means that the forward reaction from left to right must be an exothermic reaction. So let's have a look at the harbor process then. Now we can see from this overall equation that we have four moles of gas on the left, two on the right, and it's exothermic going from left to right. So the ideal conditions then for us to create more ammonia would be a low temperature and a high pressure. Now, of course, it's gonna be a low temperature because it's exothermic. So if we lower the temperature, the reaction will oppose that change and create more ammonia. And because of the more moles on the left-hand side, if we increase the pressure, the reaction will decrease it. Now, the conditions in industry seem not to follow this. Now, 450 degrees is pretty toasty and 200 atmospheres in terms of industry isn't really as you know, crushingly high as we would expect it to be. Now, the iron catalyst is obviously just along for the ride, increasing the rate of reaction in both directions. So why? Now, the reason for this is because of the harbor compromise. So this basically comes from the fact that if you're a captain of industry and you want to earn yourself a lot of money, you want to balance the amount of ammonia that you produce with the cost because you don't just want the most ammonia, you want the most profitable ammonia. You want to make yourself some fat stacks. And the best way to do that is to have a balance of cost and output. So first things first, we're going to have a look at how temperature affects this. So because the forward reaction is exothermic, which it releases heat, that means that we would ideally like to have a low temperature but low temperature doesn't account for the rate of reaction. So although we would have a greater yield, we would have a very slow rate of reaction. And actually, because remember, we wanna produce this in an economic situation, we wanna increase our output. And so actually having a rate of reaction with less yield is more advantageous in industry. Now with pressure, it's the opposite way around. Pressure we find that we could have a larger yield if we were to only increase the pressure. However, having systems that can deal with high pressure is very, very 
expensive. We have to have thicker piping, tubing, the reaction vessels need to be reinforced and it's a lot more expensive to build and maintain the energy required for these systems and it just isn't economically feasible to maintain a very high pressure because it's so much more expensive. So we can visualize this by plotting the yield of ammonia against the pressure. And uh, you can see that we've got lines for two, three, four, five hundred degrees as we go through the pressures. This line I've just overlined here is the 450 degree mark. Now at 200 or 250 atmospheres around there, you can see we're only getting about 30%. However, at the temperature we're using, the rate of reaction is going to be fast enough that we get a good yield. And just going beyond that in terms of pressure is just too expensive. And you'll see that at that temperature, we'll only get 10% more by doubling the pressure. So between the four and 500 mark, we get a very significant increase in rate and the yield is good enough. Now you can see higher up in the graph, we would get better yield, but the truth is the rate of reaction is so much faster. It's also important to consider how the production actually occurs. So let's have a little look at that. So if we have a look at a flow diagram of this process in industry, you can see that we get the nitrogen coming in and we get that from the air and natural gas provides us the source of hydrogen. These get pumped in at a one to three ratio and then they go into the middle reaction chamber, four to 450 degrees, 200 atmospheres and an iron catalyst. The structure of this reaction chamber is kind of set up as like a stepped cascade of the iron catalyst. And what this does is this allows the maximum contact time with the iron for the reaction to occur. The gas kind of like goes through all the layers like this. That then moves into the condenser and understanding the boiling point of each of these helps us understand why we don't need a high yield. Now we've got the boiling point of ammonia, which is only minus 33.4 degrees C. The boiling point of H2 is minus 259.9 degrees C and the boiling point of nitrogen is minus 195.8 degrees. So all we need to do is keep the temperature somewhere above 195.8 and below 33.4 and we will get liquid ammonia and we can tap that off and then we can recycle those unreacted gases back into the chamber and so therefore it isn't as wasteful as it was initially seen. This also has the other added effect of removing ammonia from the equilibrium and if we look at our equilibrium as we remove the ammonia the reaction will shift to replace that ammonia further driving ammonia production so tapping off and condensing the ammonia has multiple uses let's have a go at some questions then so state the conditions used in the harbor process pause the video to give yourself some time for that one pop them up Alrighty then, should have got 450 degrees, 200 atmospheres, an iron catalyst and the condensation of ammonia. Next question, what role does the iron catalyst play in industry? And I want some reference to KC in your answer. Pause the video here to give yourself some time to answer that. Pop them up. So here I was looking for you to mention that it doesn't affect the value of Kc and it lowers the activation energy of the reaction in both directions. So it only changes the time it takes to reach equilibrium, not the equilibrium itself. Next question is why do the product reactant mixture pass into a condenser after the reaction chamber? Pause the video here to give yourself some time for that. pop them up and of course the ammonia is condensed and removed as a liquid and the remaining hydrogen and nitrogen are recycled back into the reaction chamber leading on from that how does that condensation affect 
the equilibrium. Pause the video here to give yourself some time. Pop them up. Of course, removing the ammonia is going to shift the equilibrium to the right hand side as we're removing the concentration of the product and therefore the reaction will shift to produce more ammonia. Okay, so we've kind of covered the harbor process now and you need to do the same kind of thing that we've done here with the contact process. So that's looking at reaction conditions, justifications of conditions, and by that I mean based on the equilibrium itself and the importance of the process. So you kind of want to complete both of these so that you have an overview of them both. You can make a table like this one if you like. And lastly, we want to have a look at the equilibrium constant and its relationship to Gibbs free energy. So we're not going to cover in this the Nernst equation, which you would cover in option C. But we said when we did unit five that delta G, when it's equal to zero, is at equilibrium. And we know that Q is equal to KC at equilibrium. So if we take the Nernst equation and we just plug in those values for our equilibrium, then we end up with this second expression and that gets rearranged and given to us in the data booklet as this delta G theta equals minus RT lun K. So we can see this as if we have the products in their standard states and the reactants as well and delta G theta is smaller than zero then K will be larger than one and products are favored over reactants and obviously that's inversely true if delta G theta is larger than one and if they're equal then neither is favored and what do we mean when we say delta g versus delta g theta well delta g theta has a single value for a particular reaction at a given temperature and pressure and we did a little bit of those calculations the other quantity delta g represents the total free energies of all the substances in the reaction mixture at any particular system composition so delta G is only constant for a given reaction. Delta G varies continuously as the composition changes, finally reaching a zero equilibrium. So this can help us understand why equilibrium is where it is, because the equilibrium is going to depend on two things. One, maximizing entropy as the universe likes to do, and two, minimizing Gibbs free energy change. Because free energy is a quantity that becomes more negative during a process we can imagine you know, if we have a going to and from b now we start at any arbitrary point any ratio any combination of these things if we say that on the line on the left hand side is 100 percent a and the line on the right hand side is 100 percent b and delta g goes up as we go up both lines so if we just imagine we start here uh, with A as the highest point for our delta G value, 100% A, then we come down to the point of equilibrium and then up to B. So this is showing us that delta G can decrease to a minimum point, and that minimum point is our equilibrium. That's no process spontaneously gains delta G. Yeah, we did that in unit five, but this is a measure of spontaneity. So the equilibrium is the point at which delta G change has been completely eradicated. We've got zero change in delta G. So you can see here, I grab some data to illustrate this online. So we've got a reaction N2O4 going to 2NO2. So on the left hand side of this graph is 100% N2O4 and on the right hand side we've got NO2. So the line joining these two, that straight line, shows the free energy of the possible compositions if the two gases were prevented from mixing. We'll have a look at this in unit 9 when we talk about liquid junction potentials for voltaic cells as well, but don't worry about it too much. But the curved line, the red curved line, shows us the free energy of the actual reaction mixture and the difference between the bottom point of that line and the straight line corresponds to the free energy of mixing these together which results in an equilibrium. So that theory taking is a little bit further than the IB requires there. Let's have a look at how we'd actually apply this in a question. So here's a really simple one. 
it's asking us to confirm the value of the gas constant. So I'm gonna look at the data booklet and I see delta G equals minus RT ln K. Now I've got my value of R is gonna be equal to when I rearrange to give me minus delta G over T ln K. Now I've got KC, which is my K in the question. I've got delta G is given to me in the question as well. So I do 79.9. However, that's in kilojoules per mole. We want to get that in joules per mole. So we're going to multiply that value by 1000 and then do that divided by the temperature, the temperature here given to us in STP is going to be 298 multiplied by LUN 1 times 10 to the minus 14. And so if you plug that into your calculator, that is going to give you 8.31, which surprise, surprise, is the same value that they give you in the data booklet. Let's have a look at a slightly more involved question where it's asking us to calculate the concentration of ammonia at equilibrium, gives us the concentration of the other components of the reaction, the temperature and the energy change. So we're still going to be using that same equation, uh, delta G theta equals RT ln K. And in that sense, this question is going to be similar to the last one. We're going to plug in our values, remembering to times the delta G by a thousand because it's in uh, kilojoules per mole equals RT ln K. Now we can use the value of are given in the data booklet this time because it's not asking us to calculate that. What we want to find is we want to find K. So I'm going to multiply that out and do uh, 33,320 is going to equals minus 8.31 times 300 because remember we've been given it in degrees. We want it in Kelvin times ln K. I'm going to rearrange that to give me ln K, which is going to give me minus 33,320 all over 8.31 minus 8.31 times 300 and then i'm just going to pop that in my calculator both of those being uh, negative there it's going to give me 13.37 then i just take the natural log of it and i get 637,572 that's not the end of the question though because it asks us to calculate the concentration of ammonia so I'm gonna write out my equilibrium expression and I'm gonna plug in the values uh, that they've given me in the question. So my equilibrium expression from the equation is NH3 squared divided by N2 times H2 cubed. Plug in the values they give us. So they give us the value for N2 is 0.1 and H2 is 0.02. So I plug in my value for KC and I do NH3 all squared over 0.1 multiplied by 0.02 raised to the power 3 and then I'm just gonna rearrange all of that to get NH3 by itself so I'm gonna do 637,572 multiplied by 0.1 multiplied by 0.02 all squared is equal to NH3 I'm not even going to write the squared in. I'm just going to go straight for square rooting that entire calculation there, which is going to give me an NH3 concentration of 0.71 moles per decimeter. Fantastic, guys. So we've looked at two important processes here. Well, we looked at one, the harbor process, and hopefully you went away and looked at the contact process. And then we looked at how the position of equilibrium depends on entropy and Gibbs free energy. We also looked at some Gibbs free energy calculations. Just bear in mind that with those calculations, you get the values in the question and you also get the equation in the data booklet. So there's not really much to remember in terms of that. Once again, guys, thanks for watching. Comment and suggestions below. Please like, subscribe, hit the bell icon, share this video with anyone you think might need it and check out our other channels, Pop'em Up Food and Pop'em Up Life. 
And as always, practice makes slightly better.